Welcome to our panel, Politicizing Engagement. I'm so happy that everyone's here and so grateful to the Theorizing the Web uh, organizers for letting us put this together. Um, I thought before we started talking about politicizing engagement, we could maybe just do quick introductions of ourselves. My name is Moira Weigel. Uh, I'm a writer and an academic on a postdoc right now, and I'm also here in my capacity as a founder of Logic Magazine. Uh, Logic is a new, have folks heard of us or heard me give this spiel? Some of you. God bless. No, someone doesn't know. Logic is a new, <laughs> a new magazine about technology. This is our latest issue. Uh, we come out three times a year and we publish books from time to time on such topics as sex, intelligence. The most recent issue is scale. Um, what else did I want to say about Logic? We have a website that is in progress called logicmag.io where you can see things. And we currently have CFPs out for two forthcoming issues. So I imagine a lot of folks here are writers or teachers or have colleagues who, who like to write about technology, politics, and culture. Please pitch us. Uh, our, next, our next issue we're commissioning for is on the theme of play. And uh, the issue after that will be about China, tech in China. We're doing a bilingual issue, which we're really excited about. Uh, did I forget anything, co-founder? No, we're good. Uh, so, yeah, these three wonderful contributors to Logic and Friends of Logic agreed to do this panel, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Sabil? All right. Well, thanks, Moira, and thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, I'm Sabil Rahman. I teach law at Brooklyn Law School, and I do a lot of work on issues of democracy, inequality, and tech platforms. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Natasha Leonard. I'm a writer, largely a political columnist. Um, I write at The Intercept and I contributed to the sex issue of Logic, a uh, huge fan of Logic, and I teach uh, critical journalism at the New School. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Huang. I'm the managing editor of a publication called the California Review of Images and Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, we are... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we're an academic scholarly journal, the presti most prestigious journal actually on this topic, uh, looking into issues around kind of Mark Zuckerberg's visual representation and visual culture. Um, so. I remember your first CFP, one of the suggested topics was Zuck race in class, and I have been laughing about it ever since. Um, cool. Well, so when we started talking about the idea for this panel back last fall, last winter, we were talking, you know, it was sort of that moment when the tech companies had been called before Congress for the first time, the sort of tech backlash that we've been inhabiting was getting started. And it struck us that this metric engagement that engineers are told to optimize for was sort of coming into question in a certain way that it hadn't been. Uh, the idea that a platform like Facebook is a neutral tool, uh, the idea that an engineer always wants to optimize for engagement, and engagement is self-evidently good because if people are using it in a certain way, they must want it. These sort of libertarian ideas around technology that have often suffused Silicon Valley culture seem to be coming into question for the first time. So I think we wanted to think about how is engagement not neutral? Like what politics are embedded in this idea of engagement? What might other metrics be? But anyway, I thought it would be fun to start with a lightning round, since the three of you have expertise in these like very different domains, and think about terms of engagement, how we define engagement, and what we talk about when we talk about engagement. So I thought, Tim, since you have experience in industry and know about how these companies, uh, big tech companies, work on the inside a bit, I wondered if you could talk about how folks within the industry talk about engagement and how engineers at big platforms think about that term. Sure, definitely. So one way I, I like to frame up some of these issues is uh, really kind of building on sort of the notion of uh, sort of James Scott's seeing like a state, right? So the theory here is basically that uh, states, in order to administrate, basically need to introduce all sorts of systems to allow it to administrate, right? And there's a number of things that you do in terms of quantification and standardization uh, that are really required uh, at, at basically trying to manage large amounts of people, large amounts of technology, large amounts of capital. And one of the things I think that we see in the engagement case is uh, what we might call sort of seeing like a platform, right? Which is uh, how do you take this kind of global sort of billion plus person platform and, and try to make it better, quote unquote, right? And really in, in that case, you've kind of gone to sort of what is most visible or easy to get to, right? So you say, well, maybe one way of indicating whether or not people like it or not is just whether or not they use it at all. Um, and so I think we see this sort of very kind of impoverished vision of engagement sort of emerging um, as kind of engineers and other people who are really kind of trapped in this product process on a quarterly by quarterly basis, right? Say, okay, so how do we demonstrate we're having success? And the easiest way is to look at things like clicks, like views, 
Um, but you know, I think this is one of the interesting questions, right? Is that they've kind of gone to what's most uh, sort of easy to acquire in terms of data. Uh, the results have been perhaps uh, not as kind of fulsome as a term like engagement might suggest. And so I think the question is this kind of mitigation between sort of the complexity of a term like engagement uh, and, and sort of the simplicity of the metrics that are being used within industry uh, to try to capture that or to measure that. That's super interesting. On the topic of sort of like broadening or enriching how we think about engagement, I was curious, Sabil, how you think about like civic engagement in relation to these tech platforms and infrastructures or democratic ideas about engagement that we have from maybe older tradition. Yeah, no, that's great. We're just kind of building off of uh, some of what Tim laid out. So, um, you know, if we, it, it, uh, so I guess a couple of things. I mean, one is, you know, part of the, the pitch, right, of the platforms is in part that they are enormously powerful and, and on theory, beneficial tools for civic engagement, mm -hmm. right? Think about how much of political a activism, whether uh, we think of that in a positive way or in a, in a harmful way, how much of that happens on Twitter or on Facebook, right? And is enabled by those platforms. And so there's a way in which the civic engagement piece of engagement is one of those uh, metrics that is sort of presented as a, a, a point of success. Um, but I think, you know, kind of to build off of uh, the way Tim framed it, there's, the downsides, right, to how we understand engagement as clicks or as uh, engagement with the platform, it's not the same thing as engagement with communities, as engagement with relationships, as engagement with uh, politics and the polity, right? What you're engaging with is the platform and on the right. platform's terms. And so if you think, you know, one way to think about it is, you know, architecturally. So I build a house and I invite you into that house. Um, but there's only one door and it only leads to a particular room that is kind of uncomfortable for you to sit in, you know, but, um, but you know, you've entered that room because, you know, there's not really anywhere else for you to go, right? And so, you know, you've engaged, you've, you know, in that sense, like you have indicated your support for my design, but it's only because I've architected the design a particular way. And so I think part of what we, if we're talking about broader notions of engagement, it's, making a distinction between engagement on the terms as des as designed by someone else versus engagement to actually mm. design the space in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think that latter form of engagement is what we really think mean or ought to mean when we mm -hmm. say democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it just kind of goes to show how little of the platforms, even though they sort of have this veneer of facilitating democratic engagement, uh, they're thoroughly anti-democratic structures, mm -hmm. right? Um, in all sorts of ways. Yeah, that's great, that's really helpful. Um, Tash, given all your experience covering and participating in, you know, or watching for years now movements like Occupy and Antifa and other kinds of political work, I'm wondering how you think about engagement uh, both in those movements or those activities and then also in how they use platforms and sort of mobile tools, online tools. How do you think about engagement? Well, sure. I mean, part of the issue is a lot of these discussions when people talk about the like problematized idea of clicktivism and online activism is the the platform gets sort of reified as a thing as opposed to a space in which relationality happens and a space in which subjects are produced and created and find each other and, and different different political subjectivities are made differently possible depending on what a relationship can look like through a certain platform. And that's that's not just a digital thing, right? Mm -hmm. If you're able to amass a group who are masked and non-identifiable, you've created a different political object in the streets that's able to enact something different in the public compared to a large banner holding anti-war march. And, you know, it's not that the question is never what works, it's what works towards what. And I think with every instance, we have to think of that anew. And it has to be a continuous question as opposed to a conclusion that's drawn about what do online platforms do for activism? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously you have something like Coney 2012 that like remains as this ur example. <laughs> and you remember like amazing, right? Um, <laughs> and, and that sort of produced this idea of what, what, what can go so wrong about Twitter activism? and the kind of potential for meaninglessness in the creation of these uh, abstracted meanings. But then at the same time, people would talk about the Arab Spring as a Twitter revolution. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was also misleading. So mm -hmm. you saw it, you know, the use of Twitter as one tool in a toolbox mm -hmm. um, that certainly shaped, That's... plays a role in shaping any sort of movement, any sort of revolution, but in the same way, anything shapes it, like any sort of tool that is engaged in and any sort of possible tools 
determine the shape of a movement and what happens in it. I don't think it's anything particularly unusual when it's digital as opposed to meat based mm -hmm. uh, aside sometime, aside from scalability mm -hmm. um, but there's nothing there's no I wouldn't want to draw a value judgment per se on clicktivism. I think that was a really facile debate mm -hmm. on the whole. Super interesting. That's a great segue. I was curious, like, so if we have these different definitions of engagement in the air and we have this sort of industry view of these kinds of metrics that are easy to measure and assess and assemble, these sort of two definitions of engagement in civic life or political life, and then these kinds of structures of relationality that you're talking about, I'm curious if these different ideas about engagement that we have in the air are like in conflict with one another? Are they complementary to one another? I mean, I feel as if the answers that you've given already have started to touch on this, but is like the kind of engagement that a platform like Facebook wants to optimize for at odds with somehow trying to organize people towards democratization or like towards movements that might work on building a more democratic infrastructure, that kind of thing. Does anyone want to go first? Uh, really quick, uh, just on that. I mean, so I think there's a subtext in all three of our, our comments, but just to make it plain, right, it it matters a great deal sort of uh, what the purposes behind the engagement optimization are, mm -hmm. right? And so Facebook is not a public organization, uh, right? It's a private firm whose objective is to maximize uh, not necessarily profits, but to maximize return uh, for its owners, its shareholders. Um, and that means a certain use of the tools and a certain way of measuring engagement. And then also it means sort of uh, either, it, it sort of affects the way, what we can, the degrees of freedom that we can expect the platform to sort of uh, pursue, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's just a structural uh, yeah. problem that, you know, our ver versions of engagement might imply a platform structure, require a platform structure that might, we c that maybe we could imagine. Mm -hmm. But what are the political and economic incentives behind the existing platform is a big part of the story. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Sure. Um, either way, um, <laughs> I, I'm interested when, uh, actually sort of to carry on from that and to answer your question about the, the kind of potential conflicts therein. Um, I think about, it sort of just popped in my head, I think about the way Virilio talked about highways hmm. and moving through cities and things that we use and need to be denizens, right? And for like mm -hmm. a, a polity to sort of make sense. But Virilio's point was also every technology, every sort of space that, every, yeah, essentially every technology carries its own risk inherently. Mm -hmm. So you design the aeroplane, you're also designing the aeroplane crash. You design the the network and, you know, including that that's overdetermined by it being a vast monopolistic private company. <laughs> but even just the fact of a, a mass connecting network carries the own, it, it, it carries surveillance as its inherent risk, it carries misuse as its inherent risk, it carries miscommunication as well as it carries communication and that's, you know, as true as, you know, the building of Titanic included the fact that Titanic could sink. Right. So I think that's just a kind of point about technology that predates, obviously, um, and the internet and social media and anything like that. Yeah, I would love to hear your Seville respond to that, not to put him on the spot, but Tim. Go. Sure, I mean, I think one way of framing it up from the discussion, I think, is is this interesting question on whether or not the measure of um, the measurement of engagement is sort of itself the harm, right? Mm -hmm. That is to say, like the act of measuring engagement is mm -hmm. uh, is you know ultimately kind of cheapening the whole notion of engagement, right? So uh, to put that in concrete terms, right? Does the fact that an activist group using like, does the fact that they use Google Analytics, like, is that the harm itself, that you visualize a movement in those terms? Mm -hmm. uh, or is it, does it come down to actually the, the possessor of the, the kind of um, quantification that is part of the problem? And, and the answer is it, it could very well be sort of both, but I think it's important to keep those two types of harm separate because I think they present actually quite different conceptual issues. So. I'm like, as a platform capitalist, no, if someone engages in a platform capitalist doesn't measure it, does anyone hear it or whatever? <laughs> it's like, the, what is engagement? I would love to hear you, Tim, because I know there's something you thought about. Talk, are there like different ways of thinking about this within companies or sort of like within organizations that you feel are relevant to think about here? Like how different engineers within a single company like Google sure. might be thinking about engagement? Yeah, so one of the things I, I did before I, I uh, took on this post at the journal um, was uh, that um, uh, I was helping to do public policy around AI and machine learning for, for Google. And I think 
one of the things that sort of comes out of that experience um, is the idea that we often have this kind of notion of Facebook as basically sort of like this monolithic entity, which is basically now saying, you know, we, we want to totalize all of human engagement through metrics. And what's interesting is that kind of misses the, the kind of interesting dynamics that occur within the company. That is to say that, you know, there, there often does not tend to be like a single entity saying these are the metrics you will apply. Instead, there are many kind of separate entities within the company fighting each other for influence and control within that corporate entity. And sort of metrics are kind of marshaled as a way of uh, gaining advantage over one group or another. Um, and what in what's interesting with that, I think, is basically that rather than sort of these metrics really driven by these kind of external logics, that there are actually these internal logics that justify external data collection. Mm -hmm. um, and in many cases, everybody knows that the, the numbers are trash, right? And I think that's one of the interesting things about measuring engagement is that most people know, like, clicks mean nothing, views mean nothing, and like a lot of that traffic is bots, right? And so there is this kind of really interesting game that's sort of played internally as to like what leaders within a company think is credible and how do you get the numbers to like justify the action that you want to take. And so there's almost this kind of internal theater that plays out in our discussion about what are the metrics that we land on externally, right, and feel uncomfortable about as a matter of sort of the public sphere. Do you see, sorry not to put you on the spot, sure. but in something that's been important to Logic and that we've been following very closely is a sort of tech worker activism and engagement over the past year or so since the Trump election. Groups like Tech Workers Coalition, Tech Solidarity, New York DSA, Tech Action Committee have been of great interest to us. Have you ever encountered or can you imagine scenarios in which those kinds of debates over what metrics mean internally also produce like activist potential or political potential among engineers or people in an organization? I think so. I mean, if anything, it's it's sort of like the internal absence of metrics knowledge, which has actually like been like a spark for political action within the company. So I think here about basically like Google suppression of like wage differentials among genders, right? Just for instance. And so like for instance, <laughs> right, right? And and I think that case is a really interesting one in that, you know, for such a metrics driven company, like, why, why would you deny access to these metrics, right? And so I think there is actually this question about sort of who is seen and who has access to see, uh, which is actually kind of like a much more complicated part of the story rather than like, isn't the problem that everybody just thinks about likes all the time, right. so. And that's been really galvanizing, I know, for like lots of various kinds of folks around the industry and activists. I'm backtracking a little bit, but I was keen to hear Sophia respond to the idea about highways in Virilio, because I know you think about yeah old antitrust structures and old, older kinds of networks and how they might help us think about today. Totally, and um, uh, no, that was great. I have thoughts on, on both of these last comments, which are, which are uh, so provocative. Um, uh, but maybe first uh, a, a sentence or two about uh, what Tim just said. You know, I think this idea of uh, metrics as a language uh, of power, right, both internal to the firm and then in our larger conversation, right, the thing we measure then becomes the language that we use to make claims uh, one way or another, right? Um, and then the thing we can't measure becomes the thing that we then become silence, right? The thing that we can't talk about. Um, and so, so there, there's an interaction between the be, between these sort of things of metrics, language, and then the kinds of arguments that you can make, and then therefore the kinds of politics that you can imagine, either internal to the firm or or externally, more generally. Um, there's this uh, phrase, uh, you know, every card-carrying political scientist, of which I'm one, um, uh, has this is be, has this phrase beaten into their head in graduate school, which is uh, about politics. Congress is a they, not an it. Right? Congress does not ever act of one will. It's 535 people, uh, and, and it's a product of all these internal factions that produces outcomes. But as you were talking to him, I was very much thinking about that. You know, Facebook is a they, not an it. Um, and, and that's something that we often sort of forget. Um, but now backtracking a little bit to the to the infrastructure point um, that Tash raised. So I, I love that analogy. I'm going to look up uh, this, <laughs> this piece you, may, you mentioned. But um, uh, so I mean, yeah, I think, you know, my, and so my own work, the main way I've been sort of trying to theorize the platforms is as infrastructure, right? Um, and, and so it's very much analogous to Standard Oil, to the railways, to, uh, uh, you know, Robert Caron, the bu building of, um, uh, Bob Moses, sorry, and building of, uh, of the highway system in New York. Did you I read always, the power version, no, like well, all of it? Well, it, it's, it is, it is it, I, more than once, <laughs> which, which is, uh, took me a long time. So, really? yeah, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, to be around, but yeah, <laughs> oh gosh, it is now it is now a doorstop. I can't lie, but um, uh, but no, but so so the, you know this idea of uh, uh, designing the infrastructure also means we design the failures um, that that infrastructure conduces to. Uh, but I think the fact that it is infrastructure sort of heightens the stakes of a lot mm -hmm. of these types of concerns, and so even you know. 
so I do a lot of legal history uh, on some of this stuff. And what's fascinating is you go back and you look at you know that moment in time where the new technology was gas works and water uh, water piping systems. And the language that people are using to wrestle with that problem is very much the language that we're using now in the tech context, mm -hmm. right? They're worried about this is stuff that we all depend on. This is, uh, but this is in private hands. And we're not so, to, so sure how do we hold that private control of infrastructure accountable to the public purposes that we want to direct this stuff to. And, and you see all these old court cases about like, Water shutoffs and gas, you know, it's like it's fascinating, and it's, but it's exactly in the same terms that we're now talking about Facebook, right? And um, and the whole legal regimes we build to sort of try to make our way uh, to something less dangerous. And yeah, and I think just also short response to that in terms of potential solutions, I recommend the work of Ben Tarnoff uh, in talking about uh, making uh, our digital selves and existence online uh, a public good. Um, but I, what I think is interesting, and it also traces back to the like thinking of a they as opposed to a sort of one singular top-down power, is that I think this is also a broader problem of, of political discourse and how we understand power. Um, and this kind of very old-fashioned sort of thinking of pure hierarchy and pure social control through an absolute hierarchy, as opposed to a more diffuse biopolitics, a more, diff, you know, a, a cybernetic creation of maintenance and complicity and need. Um, and it's a, a, a easier, it's easier to write op-eds about like the evil guys up top. And it's easier to rally against something that seems to be singular and not diffuse and in infected through us and through which we become, you know, kill the surveillance state inside your head. It's like, it's quite hard to do. Um, but it is how we do have to understand power if we're going to address it. Um, and I think so, yeah, thinking of these things as internally diffuse and, and conflictual, but also the way that they percolate through society as diffuse and not so obviously top down. One uh, quick note about thinking about sort of Facebook or any of these platforms as infrastructures is that I think an interesting element of the politics of it is that they are often infrastructures that don't want themselves to be considered as infrastructures. Uh, so I had a, a, a debate with someone who does um, sort of content policy for Facebook. So this is the team that basically is uh, in some ways sort of the internal legislature for a company like Facebook that says, here is what we consider to be hate speech, A, B, C, D. Here's what we consider to be obscene speech, A, B, C, D. And, um, and we sort of came up to this question of, you know, so uh, how do you define terrorism? And they're like, oh, so on and so forth. And I said, well, you know that there's a number of like these international conventions, like uh, people have tackled the question of what is terrorism. Um, and they say, well, well, no, 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 no. We wouldn't want to be involved in any of the, the politics around terrorism. And so, I then, so then I said, so then I asked them, so, so what is the definition that you use? And, and there was this kind of Borgesian moment where the person articulated a definition of terrorism, which was very much on all fours with the international definition of terrorism. And when asked about it, he said, oh, well, no, 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 you see, this came through a product process. This came through a consumer, like, trust and safety process, right? And so there's this interesting thing where it kind of takes on the, the flavor of legislation, even though sort of none of its import or impact is considered, um, that you would consider in sort of like a legislative context. And so the, the very frame of the language uh, I think is playing a really huge role in in this question of like what happens if you are an infrastructure but you don't think you're you're one or perhaps even worse what do you think you're in, if you're an infrastructure but you actually aren't you aren't one right is also a really interesting question so so I think those types of kind of breakdowns uh, I think makes some of these pictures more complicated. Terrorism is a service. Um, I'm gonna go to jail <laughs> like this on the internet. Uh, that is a great segue. It's funny. I wanted us to talk about. I feel like in recent weeks and months, have folks sort of the Center for Humane Technology. Folks have seen Tristan BT. Um, I think I, I was interested when we're talking about engagement, I feel like another word that's in the air and was certainly in the air when we were coming up with this panel is exploitation. And what's the relationship between engagement and exploitation? I imagine a lot of us have, are, and there's sort of a colloquial meaning to this I'd love to talk about and a more theoretical sort of like Marxian one. Um, but I think that around the Center for Humane Technology, these new sort of apologias that we're getting from ex-tech executives saying, oh, it's too addictive. My kid is watching these weird cartoons. It's upsetting my brain hurts, et cetera, that we have this new critical discourse coming from within the industry, but very focused on sort of like health and addiction metaphors as opposed to political economic questions or justice questions. Anyway, I was curious, 
I mean, in terms of what we've been talking about enga as, as engagement, like how does engagement relate to exploitation and exploitation of user activity, user data? Maybe first colloquially, like, I don't know, what do, how do you feel about this like addictiveness discourse? Does it matter whether the Facebook notification is red or white to these larger questions that we're, we've been discussing? So maybe one initial uh, yeah. cut at that. Um, so I think the use of public health language mm -hmm. uh, uh, is also connected to this really interesting set of literature mm -hmm. around like how it is that doctors came to be, mm -hmm. right? And so I think about like Foucault and the birth of the clinic and sort of these notions that sort of public health language ends up being this very powerful way of kind of appropriating sort of power from sort of society as a whole to a smaller kind of class within society. Mm -hmm. And so it is interesting to me that there is a rhetoric of ex-tech executives saying the problem is a public health problem, <laughs> right? Because it sort of suggests that we're sort of not willing to give up sort of the elite decision-making quality mm -hmm. uh, of engagement, right? The mm -hmm. notion that like a group of expert scientists should be the ones that kind of get together in a room and say, this is what proper engagement should look like on the platform uh, is itself kind of re reifying the problem. They just don't agree that like they're not the top of Facebook they would like to be, <laughs> right. right? And that's maybe one cynical view of, uh, view of it. And, and I think part of the concern about kind of like turning this into a public health discourse, right? Because mm -hmm. um, I think the metaphor comes with a number of valences that, that uh, in many ways, I think just reinforce a lot of the problems that we see. Mm -hmm. The sort of like anti-democratic tendencies. Do we think engagement is inherently exploitative? I used to joke that it's like when thinking about whether an, an action is femis useful for feminist politics, let's consider Am I making money for Peter Thiel? Like this is a useful litmus test. Is it like is that thing I that meme I just posted, which may be attracting a bunch of people to my socialist feminist group, is it making money for Peter Thiel? And it's an interesting thing to keep in mind. Uh, and I don't think it's an easy question about whether engagement is necessarily exploitative because of the structures of capital that it's embedded in. Um, but I'm curious, can we think about engagement on big tech platforms without exploitation? I mean, formally. Right, like, like, like it, in a sort of Marxist analysis, no, that is that is what's happening. You are a free laborer, um, but uh, just to trace back in terms of that being so, it's particularly interesting that like a a, a, a health, a public health discourse, an illness discourse is being used because that has historically always been used, um, or at least in the past, you know. 200 years to deflect from more structural economic questions. Um, and yet to agree with Tim, it, what it very much does is it leaves as an impossibility that the structure, the infrastructure you're talking about would go away. So it, it maintains it as like a social inheritance, a social necessity. So when you started talking about, you know, the birth of the clinic and um, the invention of the DSM-5 and different ways of talking about the ill and the healthy in society. It's never questioned whether society carries ills. People are ill within society. So when you start talking about the potential for exploitation because of misuse, because of something going wrong or like a glitch in the system or addiction tendencies, what that's always doing is insisting that Facebook will nonetheless exist. It just refuses any sort of, well, what if it wasn't there? It demands that it's there, that we have to organize our lives being healthy within it. Um, so I think that, you know, I mean, it's kind of what you're saying about it being reified through a discourse of that. And I think that's how a lot of power structures we live in now did function and how illness discourse definitely functions outside of the tech arena. Yeah, right. So uh, just building off of that, now I think just uh, ditto both of those last few comments. But um, uh, so... One way to think about it is, I mean, there's the public health language. There's also sort of the professional uh, kind of professionalization language, right? We need codes of conduct for for the content moderators or for the platforms themselves, and um, and and these are all sort of species of the same thing, right? Which is sort of a language of responsibility, where the idea is that the infrastructure is assumed to exist and remain, um, the political economy of the infrastructure is assumed to exist and remain. And the idea is, well, we're just going to be more responsible stewards mm -hmm. of this infrastructure that is going to exist and remain as is, right? Now, that's one way you can go, right? Fair enough, right? If we think that we trust all of that and, you know, okay. Uh, but I think it's quite different from uh, thinking about the actual structure itself and then being willing to ask the question, you know, should the structure exist? Should it exist in a radically different form? Should it exist in a radically different sort of political economic form, right? So whether it's, um, you know, kind of, 
that the data is all public or the platform is a cooperative or um, you know uh, or the platform as public utility right what would that mean to to, to view these uh, information platforms as public utilities um, there are all sorts of problems with that uh, but you know we can talk more about that but uh, but I mean all of that is sort of trying to get at that deeper structural level that we've all I think been talking about in the language of health and responsibility mm -hmm our professional judgment, whatever it is, is sort of very much, uh, it's not inconsistent with a structural lens, but it's, um, it's orienting us away from those structural questions. Yeah. And I'd love to hear you go deeper on life, whether are there promising examples of the kinds of platform cooperativism or, you know, public municipal broadband initiatives, or I'm not sure what you have in mind, but that you could elaborate on briefly. Uh, yeah, just very quickly. I mean, I think there are sort of uh, a few different variations that this might take, and we, we might like some of them better than others. Um, one is sort of uh, a kind of privately regulated, uh, a privately owned but tightly regulated public utility, where essentially, you know, think of like the business model becomes very boring. You'll make a very low but perfectly good rate of return. You don't get to do all sorts of crazy, fancy stuff. The ownership structure is very simplified, um, and there are very tight restraints on what kinds of things you can and can't do. Right? That's that's one model. Another model is you actually sort of. Uh, publicize the thing; it becomes nationally owned or publicly owned in some cooperative or or kind of municipalized, nationalized form. Uh, and then a third version, sort of a hybrid, right, is that the private version stays, but there's but it's in competition with some public option, right? So this would be like the municipal broadband case. There's still private broadband in theory, but it's now there's now a public provided, plain vanilla, you know, uh, cheap but you know not without cross purposes, you know, version. Um, now, some of these might work better in the information context than others, uh, and 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 there are limitations to each of them. But I think you know, if we're taking the public utility sort of model, that sort of uh, points you in those directions. And yeah, and quite often, um, whenever these are, you know, this spread of options or even the kind of underlying idea of it is brought up, quite often you'll hear a response of like, "But then the state owns everything, and that's data, and then they own." And I mean, that's true already. <laughs> And the fact of a, a private company doesn't doesn't really put many limits on that. And we also have different examples of, to greater and lesser success, things like the difference between the BBC and Russia today. So, like, the BBC is public. It's not a private company. Um, it's part of... It is overseen by independent bodies. It is not an arm of... You know, it has its certain centrism that makes it an arm of neoliberal standard, but it's not an arm of the British government in the same way that Russia today is a propaganda extension of the Kremlin. And so, you know, we do, we can be more nuanced in terms of thinking about possibilities here than just being like, no, but I don't want the state to win it because it's the state and surveillance. Because, um, I mean, we do have examples of, yeah, things that what we want to protect from, you know, terrifying and, and hidden statecraft but we can. And just to add to that very quickly, I think um, it's a really important uh, point. And, and the distinction to my mind is, is not public versus private. It's uh, concentrated control versus democratic control. Right. right? And you can imagine concentrated forms of private control and concentrated forms of public control, neither of which is particularly democratic. Um, or you can imagine forms of democratic private control and democratic public control. Right? And so it's, it, it, re it goes back to this question about power. Right, who has the power and who has the ability to contest and control the the governance of the infrastructure? Mm -hmm. That's independent of the public-private distinction. And I feel like in America we're so used to thinking about privacy like merely in terms of government and merely in terms of like negative, negative liberties. And it's like thinking about privacy as an active social right is this whole other thing. Tim, I wanted to ask you again, given your background in industry and also your thinking <laughs> about AI. I mean, you're thinking about AI and its ethics and its politics. How do we think about exploitation, you know, in an age of machine learning and an age when the sort of, you know, algorithms are being trained on databases where we certainly don't know how, what Facebook might be using our engagement to do. Facebook also might not know what they're using mm -hmm. our engagement to do. Right. Like what special problems and questions does that pose? Sure. Um, so maybe one way of framing up where the world that we are in right now, yeah. right, is that we kind of take a look at like the way that platforms look at engagement and we're like, that's like overly simplistic and comes with very defined harms, right? You're like, you know, uh, views, right? <laughs> And you know, um, and and so one approach is like, okay, well, then the platforms need a, a richer version of engagement, mm -hmm. right? And you know, one of the things you can 
read, you know, basically the platform's investment in things like AI, right? Is this notion that like a recognition that these metrics are sort of not very good and, and this desire for them to be better, right? Sort of the use of machine learning as a way of kind of collecting up a lot more subtle patterns in people's behavior to arrive at a notion of engagement which is considered like richer and ro more robust. Mm -hmm. Now that points to this really interesting question, right? Which is, it seems like we either live in one world where, you know, the, the, the measurement of engagement is very thin and comes with a number of harmful effects, but one form of improvement is to allow the platforms to collect more data, right? And, and so I think we are kind of trapped in this sort of interesting situation where the sort of existing kind of thinness of our conceptions around engagement uh, are, are problematic, right? But um, sort of the use of AI, but more generally, I think this hope that like we can try to get machines to understand engagement uh, in, a, in, a, in a full fuller way, right? Um, you know, uh, come ag again with a lot of the same problems. And so I think that is part of the tension. It's certainly one of the things that's kind of driving like the use of machine learning in the space. But I think it's just conceptually this question about like, insofar as these platforms are interested in engagement, how actually rich do we want that conception of engagement to become, right? And, and that certainly is intention with kind of things like privacy, so. Mm -hmm. Just to add sort of this question about engagement and, and exploitation, I mean, it goes to this idea of, you know, we're, in, when engagement is the, so so one way to think about the platforms, right, is, um, uh, we can think of them as public utilities, whatever, another way to think of them is as a um, uh, kind of coal mining mm -hmm. infrastructure, right, like, but we're the coal, um, you know, so their their purpose is to extract and mine as, like, just as much stuff, vacuum up as much stuff as they can from our brains and our uh, interaction and to do what with they don't they may not even know right um, uh, but they know that that is the commodity right that is that is the resource and so the data is the commodity but more precisely it's our attention and our um, engagement on the platform that is the thing that is most valuable right and so um, that just change that's another one of these sort of background factors that just changes the the valence of all of these things we could imagine less sort of harmful ways but it's it's hard when that's the incentive structure. And and yeah, and I do think it's it's always an interesting, like I hear so many half finished sentences when these questions with like within tech discussions come up within the industry of you know richer engagement, fuller engagement, and they're, they're just so un like towards what? And like we do obviously structurally know the answer in the same way like the highway was about flows of capital, and like Robert Moses' designing of New York is about flows of capital, and so you know richer engagement towards sort of smoother lines of capital flow and a, a like smoother plane of that. Um, because like, but it can be easily masked in a discussion of, we want richer experience, richer, but at the end, you know, if you're just mining from us, us is the coal, I mean, th that could be almost like purient and pointless interests, which I mean, I'm fine with, like I'll spend hours like, clicking on pictures of like the Olsen twins. But like, like yeah, so do you. Um, and, and I do think there's like, so when, when people talk about richness of engagement, like it's this, it's really flattened, right? Like, like to what, for where, if you're gonna have a better answer than like the flows of capital in these companies, towards these companies. How to ask this? I'd be. I know it's been really interesting with some of the tech worker organizing groups that Logic has followed. That a lot of them have looked to digital media companies and like media unions for models or um, for inspiration in terms of worker organization. I'm just curious in terms of these ways of thinking about engagement. Do you have any thoughts on how they're playing out in the media ecosystem in terms of how you've seen them in your own work or others? I mean, like, and in a number of ways, right? So there is something called chart beat which is like the most boring measure of engagement. It's just clicks. And it also has an option of how long people spend on each story. But certainly that's how most newsrooms organize what they prioritize and how they prioritize, except for it, the rare examples where something has like Pierre Midier funding, like The Intercept, but they're still paying attention to these metrics because like they do need to have returns, even if they don't really need it. They like very hard for companies to think outside of capital. Um, so, you know, that's certainly over-determined so much about how the news industry 
is becoming and developed, you know. And it and I think it speaks to how little these m metrics really stand for, but then they end up standing for everything because we don't have anything else. So ad companies rely on, you know, chart beat click numbers because they have nothing else to rely on, but then they rely on it. So it becomes a feedback loop. So the news industry is organized around it. Um, and obviously that, that also made, you know, it assisted a lot of the um, profound precarity of that industry because the way you're most the way most contracts are for writers or like news workers or magazine workers or, you know, video content is at will firing. So, you know, you don't have to, and it's very different in a country like Germany where you have like, you know, if you, if you're a staffer at a newspaper, you have a job or the contract and there has to be cause if you're going to be fired. I've never signed a contract that doesn't have at will firing and that's appalling. And it really pushes this preca the precarity and a lot of the at will is because, you know, an entire editorial staff will be, like, fired all at once because they're pivoting to video at MTV News. Um, and, you know, so the efforts to stymie that or at least contain that are interesting in the kind of more and more newsrooms unionizing. A lot of the, de <coughs> excuse me, um, a lot of the demands begin with no more at-will firing. And, you know, if you, it, it's sometimes funny to look at these unionizing efforts because, the unions are asking for so little. Like, it's just like basic, a minimum amount of security and, you know, like the, not the most like appalling vagaries of <clears throat> like pay, pay floors, let alone pay ceilings. And that's what, you know, and that fight is just beginning. Um, but it definitely is a necessary answer to an industry so dependent on arbitrary but then reified so therefore overdetermining metrics maybe one way at um Mario, your question on exploitation um, i think it actually ends up being very con connected to this question of whether or not scale is ever okay uh, what i mean by that is under what circumstances right does command of attention become exploitative right or become coercive and one would say okay well you know, Facebook is coercive or exploitative because it has the ability to say, like, we want to direct all the attention towards this or that or whatever. But I think it's worth taking a step back in time and thinking about the rhetorics around the web in the late 90s and early 2000s, where the dream was, we have this long tail thing that's going to be great, right? Like, the internet's going to knock down the walls of publishing, and now there's lots and lots of small groups that will be able to kind of command attention. One of the ironies is even in a pre-Facebook era, we saw actually a huge amount of concentration where you sort of knocked down all these editorial bars and then you sort of ended up with five blogs that controlled most of the transmission of attention through the web. And there it seems to be maybe arguably a case where you say, okay, in that kind of pre-network platform era, um, you know, we still had a number of blogs that really commanded a lot of attention. Is ultimately our beef just with the notion that one or a small group of people can command attention? And that is actually ultimately what we find uh, coercive. Right? Maybe that's one cut at the problem. Is, is, is what we're talking about just a worry about scale? Uh, or is there actually something unique about control to attention that makes certain uses um, less okay than others? Right. Totally. And I, I mean, I feel like the nature of network networks and network effects are such, of course, I'm thinking of David Gruel's book on this, Network Power, but it's like that that sliding s scale in a different sense between consent and coercion, like at what point can one opt out? if everyone in the world is on a platform. Like, at the, I don't know, I think that raises really interesting questions about what consent even is and at what point one can seek to give it. And then the thing you've just raised, it's like, is the other end of the long tail of the power curve, I guess, right? right. And it kind of reduces itself to a kind of absurdity, right? Because if you say, okay, yeah, there, there is some kind of scale that we think is just, just coercive. if we don't want that in society, mm -hmm. then we get into the absurdity of like, oh, okay, did you cross that at 20 million users or 30 yeah. million users? Or like, what is that number? Right, and and I think that 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 gray area I think is really interesting to investigate, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like, what is the threshold of attention coercion? Mm -hmm. And like at that point, we want like the alarm bells to go off. But mm -hmm. I don't know if there is a justified way of doing it. Again, probably a notion of uh, again kind of arguing for considering these as political questions and right. not sort of public health questions. Not just letting Tristan Harris ring the bell whenever the scale gets too big. Right. <laughs> um, Tash or Sabiel, do you want to add? Is it possible to be disengaged? I mean, are we ever not engaged? I, mean, I think a lot of the sort of social factory type theory that's inspiring, I know to me, to some folks on the left, it's like, I, we sometimes think it's like the social factories everywhere, like exploitation happens everywhere. And that's part of what's interesting about that theoretical tradition and pivot that it makes possible. 
is engagement everywhere? Like, are we never, are we ever not engaged? Yeah, one thing I've been puzzling over uh, before this panel was a kind of, is all engagement, does all engagement require attention? Hmm. And then accordingly, does all attention require engagement, mm -hmm. right? And I feel the answer to the first one is, is yes, right? Like engagement requires attention. So just uh, carrying our cell phones around is not engagement, even if it's being... Well, it is, yeah, I think it is a form of engagement, mm -hmm. right? So basically, like, uh, what I mean, and, and to complete the thought, I guess, is sort of, but there's lots of forms of attention that don't really kind of rise to the level of what we would consider engagement, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, uh, like, you know, letting a movie kind of play past you, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you, your, your focal points of your eyes are pointed at the screen, mm -hmm. uh, but there's sort of no, no underlying engagement. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, maybe one way of thinking about it is the ways into which attention is sort of a necessary, though not sufficient condition, mm -hmm. right? I think it's. I think it raises, like, a really interesting question. But again, I'm getting this feeling of unfinished sentences. Of, um, you know, so if you can ask, are we ever not engaged? It becomes sort of, it becomes philosophical and therefore somewhat irrelevant. Like, um, you know, either you're always engaged, or, and then that's just totalizing. And that's what we call experience, right. or you're not, and then we're just going to name something else. But I don't think there are actually like. I don't think there are many stakes such that it matters that we have to decide whether or not we're always engaged in some way. That's just, for me, like a heuristic of talking human experience that could or might or might not be useful. Um, but I don't think there's necessarily like an answer that we could verify about what we mean by engagement in those terms. Um, the, like the question of can you disengage? Obviously, you know, the, the simple answer is no, not if you want to get a job, right, in a lot of ways. And that's, you know, the very coercive element of it, too. It's like, you know, even if you are not sort of constantly scrolling and on four different platforms, so many jobs say, like, send us a LinkedIn profile, send us a Facebook profile. Um, and also things that you would, like, what are the stakes? What are the, what's the pain of disengagement? Like, not knowing when your friend's birthday party is and the amount of, like, work. And that is to do with also you know, that complicity consent issue of how much smooth experience do we want to be moving through the world such that, you know, I don't have to check in about when someone's birthday is, I'm told. But that's ob obviously only because we are asked to tell when our birthdays are. And so it's the same thing of like use, practicality, movement, but with that, like any infrastructure risk. Um, but, and there is this sort of tycoon tradition like sort of wanky <laughs> philosophy boy like fog like what if we became fog like break the cybernetics by being fog and i'm just like what the f like sure fine like have your line of flight but like <laughs> stop pretending you're not overdetermined by the world you're living in like and as if you could just jump away from it like I, sometimes it would feel as stupid as you know we, we obviously laugh and decry anyone who says like i'm post-racial now or like I'm post gender as opposed to I'm challenging these things to be like post engagement through these networks is often either like just a point of isolation or a sort of a lie about how easy or possible that would be to like become fog. Like maybe uh, I didn't even I've hated Takoon for years as you know and I I didn't even know about this fog thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe to throw something on the table. I mean maybe one way of articulating a goal here, right, is maybe to think about whether or not society has the permission or the possibility of like engaging in many different kinds of ways or for engagement to be multivalent in nature. So one of the things I think that feels very um, disheartening, alienating about the nature of these platforms uh, is not so much that they command engagement, but that they attempt to securitize engagement, right? That there's an attempt to kind of take what we know of as attention and then turn it into sort of these tranches that then can be sold out, right? And, and that, that sort of uniformity of engagement, sort of the notion that we can engage in sort of a, a single or limited set of ways, uh, ends up being part of the problem. Um, and, and I think it's also simultaneously why, you know, some people say, oh, well, th the right way to resist is to have these, you know, um, th these kind of situationist experiences on these platforms. It feels liberating because it provides a new form of engagement. Uh, of course, the critique there, of course, is that it doesn't, like, deal with the underlying kind of, um, you know, capital questions around it. But, but I think kind of explains why it does feel so liberating. Um, and I think it speaks to that, that concern about sort of this, this sort of limitation or commodification of attention. 
particular securitization and commodification. Yeah, no, that's a Someone that's that. yeah, <laughs> that's the securitization. Again, that uh, that's great. Um, uh, and and I think the the financialized sort of analogy is is helpful too in in, in another respect, which is you know, so if you think of in if we think of engagement in sort of its uh, thick moral sense, right? Engagement, like human engagement with other people, with communities, with the polity, right? Not engagement in the platform sense. Um, all engagement requires some kind of uh, infrastructure to facilitate it, right? To make it possible to allow it to thrive. And we build those infrastructures all the time, right? We build communities, we build civic spaces, we build physical infrastructures, we build uh, relationship networks that are a kind of social infrastructure, right? And so part of what I think we're struggling with here is that when the infrastructure of engagement is a platformized one that is securitized uh, in all of these ways, um, not only is there a problem about that, but there's a way, in, uh, there's a there's a worry or a problem about how it's displacing or vacuuming up resources that could otherwise uh, that that could otherwise go into these other types of infrastructure. So that's a kind of a uh, very thirty thousand foot way of saying it. But to make it concrete, right? Um, if we're worried about the public sphere and public engagement in in politics. Yes, part of the problem is fake news and platforms and manipulation and, uh, on Facebook and Twitter, but that's exacerbated by the collapse of uh, of journalism and local news and um, and sort of this this older model where uh, the journalist covering an issue was a literal representative of your community because they wrote for your local paper and therefore channeled your concerns in the very questions they asked and the things that they uh, uh, wrote about, um, and so. And, and the collapse of that infrastructure is directly related to the rise of this other infrastructure. So it's really a two for one, right? We're worried about the platform infrastructure itself, but then there's a shadow worry that the platform infrastructure is making impossible, displacing or supplanting other infrastructures of human, uh, social, political, communal experience. And then how do we redirect those flows, right, of resources and whether it's our attention or financial, economic, political resources as well. Um. I wanted to respect, uh, actually, both to, to both of what you guys said. I'm really interested when you talk about sit, like a situationist, like, like, like you know, experiment within. I it, to bring it back to power again, obviously. Um, you know, who gets to be a flaneur? Like, what a privileged position. Like, always was. Who gets to like use the highway to go to upstate, and who gets to be on the slow bus to the Bronx? Um, and I think, which also plays into your sort of financialization metaphor is, you know, part of the problem of like the subprime crisis was a system that flattened difference and pretended it didn't exist because you could, you know, you could put a triple A, you could get a triple A tranche because you're flattening the difference between what the like mortgages actually were. And I think the same thing happens in a, you know, metric of user metric of flattened engagement. It fails. And that's so why it's on us to pay attention to that of like, not all users are the same or able to use things in the same way or able to disengage or engage sort of for political productive purposes, say, or like resistance or enjoyment that isn't sort of more painful. So I think, yeah, like, I mean, like, and I also think it ties back to the birth of network technologies and the California ideology and of course, it was sort of wealthy white men who couldn't foresee the like virulent risk in the thing they were producing because, you know, don't be evil. If you've got anything to hide, like, you know, if you haven't got anything to hide, like share it. Like uh, that sort of Google transparency was so much about like a privileged set of people imagining a universe. And I think so you've got, I think a lot of these problems were even born in like the glory days of the internet as potential democratic space. Um, that was a bit of a messy response. But. No, I always think of that too in terms of the metaphors of public space that get thrown around by folks like Jack Dorsey where it's like the street, Twitter's a street and it's like a street is more or less good depending what kind of body you have and how you might experience other people like heckling you on the street or police killing you on the street or you know it's I always thought about the ways in which those metaphors of the public sphere get celebrated and embraced uncritically really bespeak like the social homogeneity of Silicon Valley. Yeah. Also, just yeah. very quickly, just on that, just because um, uh, this, 
uh, always uh, annoys me that um, the, <laughs> the language of they the platforms appropriate the language of publicness, but um, if you read their uh, legal filings as they're defending themselves against the gazillion lawsuits, uh, they actually it's required for them to uh, resist the notion of Twitter as public square because if they were to uh, acknowledge that, that changes their legal position. Um, and so, as a legal matter, they their ability to do what they do requires them to not be the public square and, in fact, to uh, merely be. Um, the kind of passive transmission, uh, they're, they're the yellow pages, and that's it. And that's, and, and if, but if they're not the yellow pages and they're actually the public square, uh, or if they're neither of those things and they're actually you know, uh, the modern version of the New York Times, all, those are all radically different as a matter of constitutional and public law, and their legal liability is very different under those three models. And so there's a way in which they're arbitraging these different positions, right? They mm -hmm. can talk the language of being the public square in one, uh, in one moment and then turn around in the next and say, oh, we're, there's nothing public about us at all, right? Mm -hmm. We're just your run-of-the-mill friendly neighborhood tech company. Yeah, yeah that's why Uber is a transportation yeah. network company right. after yeah. all. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, yeah, I just want to riff a little bit on this financial metaphor a little bit more because um, I wonder whether or not it also tells us a little bit about what the, what the future might look like. Um, what I mean by that is, um, you know, what does Facebook think that it's selling, right? And so a lot of people have said, uh, Zuckerberg always says, oh, well, we, we try to represent our community, right? A lot of people have been like, there is no community. What are you talking about? Do you even <laughs> use Facebook? Right? And, um, and, and similarly, we can ask the question of what advertisers think they are buying when they buy ads on Facebook. And what they think they're buying is this concept of engagement, right? right? You're, you're buying, um, you know, the, the connections between people, right? But, but that actually doesn't end up being the case, right? You're buying sort of the clicks and likes of things that we've complained about already. Mm -hmm. And so insofar as the numbers are trash, right, I think it's sort of interesting thinking about whether or not this 2008 metaphor actually goes yet again, right? That actually what we are about to see is kind of a subprime attention crisis, essentially, right? And that in fact, a lot of ad people are buying inventory, which doesn't actually correspond to what was promised, right? Uh, and, and that stuff gets marked up, right, as Facebook goes, right? There, there are basically the AAA tranches of attention that contain nothing but um, bots clicking on ads. Right? And so there's almost a scam that both happens at the level of the consumer, but also a scam kind of that happens at the level of the ad buyer. And like both sides seem like they might cave in, right? So. You should have just told Logic that privately. We could have shorted engagement and made a gazillion dollars. Uh, and just to, like, damn. No, and just, make it a bailout, so who knows, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, in just a minute, I want to open up to questions, which is a final, and so folks, get your questions ready if you have any, but it's a final kind of lightning round. We began this conversation, we were putting together the panel thinking about engagement as a metric. Uh, and I was, you know, it's something again that like engineers optimize for. We should be maximizing engagement. I feel like we've talked about the possibilities of disengagement, of democratizing engagement. But I'm curious if any of you have thoughts about what would an alternative metric look like? Is there something other than engagement that these digital infrastructures could be built to facilitate another kind of ideal that we could hold in mind? Easy question. Uh, yeah, so one of the things I think about is that, um, you know, in engagement, we often think about aggregates. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether or not we should actually be thinking about engagements in terms of distribution, right? Mm -hmm. So that we think about like 100 likes, 1,000 likes. But maybe we should think about like who those likes actually sort of represent and whether or not there is kind of a mode or a political argument to be made for a kind of redistributive attention. Mm -hmm. Where sort of rather than trying to maximize across one value, you're trying to mm -hmm. say, do we want to maximize this value across multiple groups? Mm -hmm. And you could actually imagine Facebook saying, look, if, if this particular group drives too much engagement, we actually see that as kind of a negative, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's kind of this question of like, sort of equality of engagement, right? Or distribution of engagement mm -hmm. uh, that, that might lend itself to sort of better, potentially better results. Um, uh, to make that a little bit more concrete, I'm thinking about the exact problem where, for example, Twitter largely responds to white supremacists, right? right. Uh, but not anyone else who's been having problems on the platform. Mm -hmm. Part of that reason is because uh, they are weighing certain types of uh, large amounts of highly engaged users more than a bunch of other mm -hmm. users on the platform. And there's a number of design reasons for why that is occurring. Mm -hmm. But you think a little bit about whether or not they should shift from this notion of like, well, we just have a lot of retweets, so it all worked out well, mm -hmm. to you know, who, who do those retweets represent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the problem is that it would push these platforms in a much more outwardly political dis, dis, uh, um, direction, mm -hmm. which depending on your point of view is either them recognizing what they always were or mm -hmm. actually quite a bad development. Mm -hmm. 
Well, just just building off of that, um, I, I was trying to think through the, the sort of same type of uh, uh, use case, right? Sort of the um, the fact that content moderation, even even post 2016 and post you know Cambridge Analytica, is still very much uh, certain works in favor of already uh, powerful, you know, uh, but not necessarily majoritarian uh, constituencies, right? And so, and 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 what do we do about that? I mean. Um, I think part of it is maybe uh, so. So one angle is sort of a different measure of engagement. Um, I, I wonder if the other angle, though, is sort of going back to a theme on the panel, is um, decoupling engagement from exploitation. Sort of to, to your framing, Moira. Right? Is that if you could imagine a different political economic structure where engagement isn't securitized, it isn't uh, harvested, it isn't the thing that makes a business model run, mm -hmm. uh, then. How does that change the way the engagement is likely to be governed um, if you remove uh, those incentives um, and those imperatives, right? And 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 so that's maybe a, a sort of comp a, uh, orthogonal but but complementary sort of angle, right? Is that um, unalienated engagement, right? Unexploited in, uh, engagement as in as opposed to sort of just uh, engagement. Period. This alienate engagement. I like yeah. it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, all, a lot of the things we were talking about earlier, and specifically, of course, like you, never being able to av avoid a certain type of exploitation within this political economic model through which these run. I'm, you know, quite quite pessimistic about um, the kind of possibilities of reform in any of these spaces, um, and the possibility of thinking outside of them, given how much they you know, inform our, like, forms of life and habits and practices. Um, so I think we, when you're talking about these massive companies, I think we do have to approach them if we are approaching it from an anti-capitalist point of view and seeing that that's the only possible aperture for freedom in a uh, networked, uh, so ne digitally networked society and what could that look like. Um, I, I don't, you know, you can't really reinvent the wheel. Like, you, may, you know, if you're protesting big oil, you try and, you know, have put a cog in the works or um, make it not worth their while through, you know, either very heavy handed or mass civil disobedience, resistance, strikes. It's very hard to strike from social media without really harming yourself. Um, and so, but, you know, I think it has to be, I don't think we're going to be able to think up an answer outside of these things. I think us as users and the intimate communities we have have to find ways to resist when we see certain points of possibility. So, for example, um, the efforts of uh, certain anarchists in New York who created a, a plug-in to automatically send like mass numbers of complaint letters to YouTube when you find yourself like sifting through Nazi content and like an easy way that they and you know this is very limited and what are the how much is it really going to work I don't know but we don't have an answer here so I think we have to think somewhat small scale on what you can do to make it not worth these companies whiles to keep behaving in some of the more problematic and exploitative ways and I think you know as a small group of people compared to billions of users it's very hard to have that kind of impact but then I suppose you could start wondering about um second order things so if you could really push hard for the new york times to take a stand against twitter or you know which also seems very difficult threaten to not use facebook anymore um how would that look like if like readers could be could could apply enough pressure such that somewhat powerful institutions and powerful institutions then have stakes and reasons to be resistant or at least recalcitrant to the mega corporation of Twitter or Facebook, um, so I mean that's the only place I see possibility. I don't, I can't, I can't think outside of context enough, such an overdetermining context to be like, here's how this could work. Do you think that platforms themselves, is their model of unpredictability and serendipity, is optimized for engagement, but then the outcome can be something unexpected? Um, and then the second question is from a. You compare these platforms to infrastructures, but if you, if you move outside the US, what's so unique about this infrastructure is that it comes from a place that's very far away. You can't call anyone. So if you have, if New York Times says something, where is the national... Sorry, Sorry. I should have... I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. There's a difference. The New York Times has more power than, let's say, the Myanmar national newspaper. They, they don't even get an answer if they come. 
I was just wondering what your thoughts on this. Oh, sorry, to answer the, I'll, I'll take on the first one possibly. Um, yeah, I think what's interesting is I, I'm sure you know a lot of the execs and just workers at these companies are were like unpleasantly surprised by like Nazi Twitter really taking off and like Richard Spencer maintaining his power through it for so long and YouTube because YouTube are particularly dealing very badly with taking down white supremacist content. And I think, I, I do believe there was probably some surprise and um, uh, you know shock and abhorrence within those companies. But then to me that also echoes, it seems sort of synecdoche, the li like liberal, neoliberal mindset, ideological problem that meant people were so goddamn surprised that Trump was elected. Yeah. Um, you know, they're like, maybe they you know invented and, and built up platforms on this kind of end of history presumption that like, oh, everything's just gonna be like liberal and normal and maybe a bit conservative, but like, and that speaks to, you know, a lot of design and a lot of innovation in these spaces, not even taking into account the publics that, um, that even exist and that are building. Um, so I'm sure there was surprise, but like, we shouldn't be surprised that there was surprise because who is, who are the executives here? Who are building these platforms? Um, they're probably the same people that were just, you know, blown out of the park when they when Hillary Clinton didn't win. And I'm being kind of speculative, but it, it, this is what I think. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's to this question of like unpredictability. Um, and you know, I think one of the things I observed working inside the companies is the tendency to sort of play the the tails I win, heads you lose sort of game. Uh, what I mean by that is when the platform has a, a highly regarded success. It's usually uh, the comms are well. It's really great that Twitter facilitated this revolution. Like it's it's awesome that we have this platform and that people connect and community blah blah blah. Um, but when there's a highly profiled uh, failure, the tendency is to be like, well, it's a few bad eggs on the platform. Users, you know, I kind of tell what they were going to do. Um, and I think there is kind of a tendency in in the comms around some of this, which is kind of its layer outside of just kind of like kind of the purely economic of it, which is. Um, the platform is kind of being able to play certain roles at certain times and emphasize their relative influence or lack of influence over over the situation. Though I think really I, I, my sense of a lot of the numbers and it, it is that it's an attempt to kind of like control something which is actually always kind of slipping out of grasp. Um, I have this question for anybody who wants to answer it. Um, so long as we are stuck in this engagement hellhole that apparently we are unable to escape from for the time being, do you think that there is the possibility of, and then if it is possible, any utility to the idea of unhelpful engagement that generates useless data, sort of like culture jamming engagement on social media and like what would that look like and should we bother doing it? I mean, there was this like very playful project called like the useless press, which was about um, it was like Sam Levine's project with Alix Rule, and it was very much about like what does it look like to not talk about optimization, to talk about like de-optimization in developing online tools and developing you know uh, 3D printers of like absurd, like playing with the absurd. And I think so. I think it's interesting, and I think it can be playful. What would it look like on a mass scale? How would you get there? Is the same problem of how would we any sort of resistance in these spaces? Um, so I like the idea of it. Um, it also speaks a little bit to like who has the privilege to use those platforms that way, given that like actually a lot of use is how we have to organize our lives, unfortunately. Um, and also I just think it, you know, if some people doing it at a small scale, I don't see how it could really make any impact, but it doesn't mean don't try. I think I like the idea of de-optimizing. Yeah, and I think this connects also to the, the earlier question about sort of uh, center periphery uh, and the uh, kind of who can contest the infrastructure in the New York Times versus, uh, you know, press in Myanmar or wherever. Um, uh, I think one way maybe to think about it is what, uh, uh, so in the same way that we've been sort of diagnosing uh, different forms of st uh, structural drivers of the problems that we're talking about, I think if we're, as we're talking about sort of responses, we similarly have to think about what's that same spectrum between sort of uh, uh, of structural on the one end to um, sort of, uh, uh, I'm not sure what the word is, but sort of maybe more um, uh, a kind of short term response or resistance on the other, right? And there's, and I think this, this may be, you know, where we put it on the spectrum, we can debate, but I think, uh, to Tash, your point, right? Some forms of resistance we can imagine sort of being uh, 
uh, ch- kind of being provocative in certain ways, and and that's useful. Uh, but at some point, we need to figure out what's our structural imagination of resistance in this, given the structural nature of the problem. Yeah. And just one sh- short point on that too. It's like um, we should remember as well, like how. D- how adaptable capitalism is, how adaptable capitalism. So, you know, weird Twitter didn't throw a cog in the works of Twitter. It was just more Twitter. Um, (laughs) It was great, but it's just, so, you know, perhaps using the tools of networking to create other forms of resistance, great. But like the resistance within the form and a form that largely is just about addition, aggregation, the more, um, adding the more in a way that's sort of diffuse and weird and a bit useful, like they're still used to that. Like what, you know, you can hate watch The Apprentice or love watch it. The ratings look the same. Uh, really good, really good point for me to ask this question. Um, so I was interested earlier on the thing about, the, sorry, I'm just looking, checking my notes, the things Sabeel said about the things that can't be measured are kind of excluded from discourse. And this is quite interesting because that's a very good example, whether if I watch The Apprentice, you don't know anything about my kind of my subjectivity around it. And there's a, there's a question here about whether engagement is sort of implicitly subjective and whether the act of trying to measure. Um, so there's even possible. And uh, given that is the idea that tech companies are attempting to do so and are kind of making this claim that it's possible. Does it say something about the culture of the tech industry that they feel that they I just just very quickly, I mean I'm sure Tim and Tasha have thoughts on that. But um I mean I think this goes back to the part of something Tim said earlier, right? Which is um uh that's something we have to ask whether we whether the problem is is the problem how we're measuring or is the problem the fact that we're measuring in the first place, right? And so um, if you take away the measurement or the ability to measure, then that changes stuff in, in a pretty dramatic way. And um, and to sort of connect it to some of the other themes we've been talking about, about resistance and infrastructure, I mean, um, you know, if you look back at these historical moments of debates around other types of technological infrastructural transformation that I mentioned, one of the interesting things is that part of the debate is um, can we, do we trust anyone with the, with the power that this new technology or infrastructure affords? And if not, if we don't trust our ability to build a system to hold it accountable to what we, the public, think it ought to be, then maybe we shouldn't have it in the first place. Now, that's a hard bullet to bite, right? There's a cost there, but that's the nature of these things, right? And so I think in the same way that uh, the platforms can't pretend that we can have our cake and eat it too, we also can't pretend that we can... Uh, sort of have our cake and eat it too in the other direction, right? At some point, if we think this stuff is a problem, we're going to have to uh, make changes in, in ways that are structural. That means certain things that we like as well probably go away. Um, and that's just a hard choice we have to make. Thanks. Um, I think there are a lot of incentives to uh, force legibility where it doesn't exist. Um, so the anecdote I love most about this one is the the McDonald's commercial patent. I don't know if you saw this one, but sort of the notion would be you'd be watching um, an ad on your smart TV, and um, if you didn't want to watch it, uh, you could signal that you had seen it by standing up and saying the name of the brand. So you'd stand up and you go, <laughs> you'd go McDonald's, uh, and uh, and I I think those moments exist, and there's lots of incentives to kind of create those types of engagement because you need to be able to like measure in order to show success, so that there are lots of mechanisms that are continuously created um, to to encourage you to sort of signal. Uh, your engagement. Um, and so so I, I think the tendency will be, um, if it isn't legible, it will sort of be made legible in order to kind of justify the system. Uh, no, uh, first, thank you guys so much. I really got a lot from this discussion. Um, I, I'm really, cu- like, you guys did a, such a good job of, I think, sort of breaking down a lot of binaries, like the, you know, the whole thing between public versus private, and, you know, just like making things a little bit more complicated than they are. And um, something that you guys sort of brought to the forefront of my mind what is this idea of like individual engagement as a catalyst for change like forcing these platforms to change versus regulation um and so on, on one hand you know you have a lot of people like like jillian york you know she, she had this great piece in buzzfeed about how oh let's go back to the old facebook just use facebook like you would before yeah basically or like to to post exactly but or, or to post you know on people's walls instead of you know like and you know install ad blockers all this stuff then on the other hand, you have people calling for regulation 
But that's also really scary because you have people like Senator Cornyn, who's like calling the Internet like a series of tubes still. So I my question for anybody um, on the panel is, you know, um, how do you guys think about the relationship between individual action and engagement, the topic of this panel, I guess, and um, uh, in the relationship to more structural changes that we should be thinking about when grassroots efforts like individual engagement fail? Thank you so much for your questions and for bringing that all into the space. I hope we can hang out for a minute afterwards and talk to anyone who wants to hang around, but I do think we need to get out of the room now. Um, you know, we started Logic because we wanted to bring together different kinds of people in the same space. And this kind of event is like a total realization of what we most hope for with it. So thank you so much all for being here. Thank you to our wonderful contributors and to Theorizing the Web.